The amazing French city of Edon was one large, enormous battlefield during the First World War. Before the war, several fortified lines and forts, large and small, had been built surrounding the city, and the Germans never quite managed to encircle the city of Edon, which might not exactly have been their battle plan to begin with. But some of these forts are large, enormous artillery forts, and some of them are smaller positions in between these to shore up the line. And a lot of them are very interesting, have fascinating battle stories, and we're going to, of course, visit all of them, myself and Roger, and tell you and share some of these stories. And the very small, obscure forts you never thought you'd hear about, actually, some of them are completely intact. We'll show you that towards the end of this episode. And they sent a message, and the bombers turned back afterward. But here we have the uh, Ouvrage de Frater. It's an intermediary uh, small fort without a ditch, that's why it's called an ouvrage, just a uh, barbed wire entanglements all the way around. Uh, originally meant as an infantry position, but it was later given uh, gun turrets, a twin 75 gun turret in a block, two before machine War, gun turrets. Before World War One. Before World War One, yeah, before the battle started. There's also a Kazmat de Bourges holding two 75 millimeter guns, which fire out to the side and cover the river. They cross their fire with uh, an ouvrage on the other side of the Meuse to stop the Germans coming down the river. So this was one of the forts that was upgraded before World War I with up-armored yeah. and yeah. cement and... Yes, it would have been a, 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 a stone and earth emplacement, which they completely rebuilt. They rebuilt it in reinforced concrete, the, uh, the barrack block, uh, and the uh, the turret block and the the Kazmet de Bourges were all in reinforced concrete. Uh, now what happened was that the the last but one battle uh, fight in the struggle for Verdun was that uh, German troops crossed where the barbed wire had been blown away in a gigantic bombardment, and they actually got onto the roof of the barrack block, and they were dropping explosives down the ventilation shaft to set the place on fire. The commander ordered his machine gun turret to be raised to drive them off the roof, but so much debris had landed on it that it, it was jammed, it couldn't lift. He sent a runner out of the door, zigzagging across the courtyard, uh, with the Germans on the roof firing at him. He made it to the gun turret block, threw himself in the armored door, and passed on the order to raise the turret. The turret commander followed and fired 126 75 millimeter shells, uh, shrapnel shells, onto the roof of the fort. And the poor Germans were massacred and driven off. They and never came back here. And we're standing in the center of the Verdun battlefield, pretty much. Well, the Verdun battlefield goes round the top of Verdun, basically. It's a, it's a semicircle. I mean, so we're halfway around the arc, if you like. Everything is the Verdun battlefield, really, isn't it? Yes. If they'd captured this ouvrage, they'd have descended to the river they'd have turned left and they'd have been in the center of Verdun uh, within minutes. There's nothing else to stop them. So the Germans never captured this? They never captured it. They were driven off. Yeah. But again, it's interesting because this is what looks like almost a World War II fortification yeah. in the middle of one of the battles that is famous for mm. trench warfare. Yes, but yes. this is so much more than trench warfare here. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, this is uh, armored turrets firing uh, to drive troops off the top of the forts. Troops in the open. The only thing that's a little troubling is the outhouse. Ah, that's the uh, peacetime toilet block. Peacetime toilet. The wartime toilet block is inside. It's called the bucket. The bucket. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. And the uh, machine gun turret over there. And I see, once again, a lot of holes. Yes. Everything is one big. This is a really big one there, yeah. Interestingly, this turret, which was abandoned in World War II, uh, something happened to it. Either a German tank came up the end of the entry road, and the crew panicked when they saw the turret up in the air and fired at it, or an American armored car, or a light, uh, a steward light tank came up in 1944 and did the same thing. Because we have 37 millimeter armor piercing shells, which have tried to claw their way into the turret and failed. There's even one of them still, still stuck in the turret. 
Could be, yeah, because everybody used 37. Yeah, it could be a Panzer Mark III or a, or an American armored car or a Stewart. During World War II, there was no fighting here, was there? Uh, no, no fighting here. So, the, oh, just imagine a line, uh, several forts did go into action against the German troops. But they this is not one of them. This is not one of them. No, no, no. This was completely abandoned. Yeah. And th th that's why so many of them have been scrapped. The, the, the Todd organization came in and took away the turrets and just left big holes. The most powerfully armed fort, uh, Vacheroville, is now just a series of holes in the hillside. And it's sealed off as a bat sanctuary, so we can't go and see it. So this is all shelled? Yep, there's a shell hose on the parade ground. That was the parade ground? Yep. There's the rampart, what's left of it, the concrete rampart that the soldiers would man with their rifles and machine guns, which ran all the way around. There's only that little bit left. <laughs> so this was German shelling? Yes, German shelling. French didn't shell this. And I see, I see the barbed wire still yeah, sticking the, out yeah. down there. Yeah, the pig's tails. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really inter It's a little ironic to be in a place where guys would literally drown in water-filled shell craters yeah. uh, here at Verdun, yeah. and it's raining and they're full of water. It. Uh, one could only imagine this place without any grass, without any trees, all mud, everything torn up, shells landing constantly, and you try to navigate this landscape. Here they are. Yep, there are the two 75 guns that uh, warded off the last German attack with the direct sight. Yes, and 1903 turret, 1905 turret. 1905 turret, yeah. The reason why a runner had to be sent, sent to direct the turret is because firstly, the, there were no tunnels dug between the various sections of the ouvrage. They hadn't had the time to dig the tunnels when they installed the fighting blocks. And the telephone wires had been cut um, in the bombardment, so a runner had to actually run down here because there is, no, um, there is no control post. There is one for the machine gun turret. There's one for the other machine gun turret over there, I think, yes, beyond it. But this turret has no, uh, no lookout. And it it's has blind. That, and if the telephone tunnel if telephone cables get cut by yeah. telephone, this is a lesson the French should have learned before World War II mm. that they should have had radio mm. or other means of communication yes. because yes. they insisted on telepho telephones. Yeah. Telephone cables laid shallow, they get destroyed, and they learned yeah. that lesson right here, but they yeah. didn't assemble ah, it. Well, the Maginot Line had underground armored cables with connection boxes. Yes. And they had, because they, their ouvrage with the uh, reinforced concrete were, were a Faraday cage, they had to put the aerials on the outside. Yes. And the last resort, there was a ferocious German attack on a Maginot uh, blockhouse. And the Germans were, uh, they destroyed all the machine guns. They were coming in for the final rush. And the French commander, he leaned out through a hole in the wall and fired the three green stars from his very pistol. That signal meant to every French gun within range, fire on me. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they did. That's your final resort. Broken arrow. That monster. That's a 42 centimeter. There are some gigantic holes here. That is a... Go over to the town, you can see a huge amount of earth blown away. But that runs around, have a look. And that's all that's left of the rampart. This is all <laughs> that went all the way around the fort, the Ufras. Yeah. I wonder if that shell crater has something to do with moving it a little <laughs> laterally. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of thing that will be is impossible to know. Who died where? What fired what and what is... Well, I don't think any of the French garrison were killed here. There was hundreds of poor Germans who were blown to bits. Holy! The, uh, yeah, that's a big hole. The, um, the shells, they explode, they burst open immediately on leaving the gun barrel. Spraying the, uh, the canister, the shrapnel. Out. Yeah. That was a big hit. This is the, cor this is a, a, the corner of a, of a of a casemate that should be buried. 
This should never have been exposed, should it? No, that's been dug up by a German shell. Yeah. This is all underground? Yes. That one actually turns. <laughs> but strangely enough, I don't think they'd had time to install one for the 75 turret. So in fact it was blind at the time of the German attack. It's just amazing how this thing literally just exposed side of the building. Yeah, and the concrete survived. The concrete survived. And the little observation dump. We have a very uh, varied uh, wildlife. Frogs, newts, they come and they populate the forest. Well, you do now because all this, I, I wager, was never wet or holy before no. World War One. This is all yeah. a man-made uh, swamp here, really. Yeah. You can relocate, you can do a lot of redecorating with artillery. Now, I'm guessing this also was not supposed to be exposed. Oh, yeah. I've never climbed on this bit of the roof. My God! Yeah, that's a shell hit. The wall is perfectly intact. Yeah. It just yeah. relocated a whole bunch of little worms and <laughs> a lot of yes. dirt. Well, I, never, I, never, <laughs> I never climbed up here to see that. That's really scary. I mean, it, it's amazing that we're looking at over, a, what are we looking at, 100, uh, 105 years, and, and you still have all these shell craters. <laughs> all right, well, it's in the back of the car. All good. Don't worry, y'all. Here is the signaling, the optical signaling post. The only one you can see on the battlefield. There must be others, but they're in Now that's fascinating, that, that is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Because this is not at all what people think it is. Here we have a very interesting uh, construction added on to the uh, Kazma de Bourges with its twin 75 guns firing out to one side to guard the river crossing actually. And most of my French students who arrive here think this, these are firing ports. But in fact, they are signaling ports. This is uh, an optical signaling station. And each one of these tunnels is directed towards a neighboring fort and back down to Verdun. So if you wanted to send a message to, say, uh, uh, the Citadel, you would choose the tunnel marked Citadel and flash your message. But of course, the big drawback is that uh, if the scenery is obscured by smoke, explosions, morning mist, but the light would only be seen at that tunnel. Now you couldn't. No, no you one couldn't could intercept the light. It's a, it's a private message, basically. But uh, when that fails, when that's obscured, then you uh, you fall back on the faithful old pigeon. The pigeon always gets through. <laughs> Two uh, seventy-five embrasures. They would have had um, metal shutters over them, <laughs> which would cover nothing. But there is a gigantic concrete wall that protects the embrasures from the enemy side. So this is, we are, we are protected, we are behind the wall, firing off to one side. We're not firing towards the advancing Germans. You're fired, uh, firing towards the, the fort next to We're you. We're firing to cover the fort next to us, yes. And like Maginot, the guns were of a limited caliber, so you could fire on your own fort without doing too much damage. You wouldn't exactly. blow up your own fort. So if enemy troops were on the roof, you would drive them off. And if you scratched the paint, well, you know. Yeah. You had observation up there? Is that what it is? That's uh, yes, there are two embrasures for firing and one observation. And that's... Um, where is that? Is it around the corner? Oh yeah, and you still see the, uh, you still, yeah, the rails. And they're overhead rails, model rails, for changing the gun barrel. Thanks. Yeah. The multiple, the dark and light green, and the, and the dark earth. Well, it did take some hits up here. 
I see. Yes. See, it's begun a sporadic, spontaneous disassembly. But of course, the enemy was some beyond this. The enemy is, is the other side of this. So they couldn't hit the they cannon couldn't, positions. They couldn't hit the embrasures, no. Did, did this get the fire on the Germans during World War I that, that way? That if they came down the river, they had to capture this place. If they didn't capture it, then they would be taken out where they tried to cross the river. But don't forget the river would be sown with barbed wire and other obstacles. Yeah. So you'd have to fight your way across the river. And if these things are throwing 40 shells a minute at you, you're not going to make it. No. And the other ouvrage, the other side is throwing another 40 shells a minute at you from the other direction. And uh, you know it's going to happen. You don't try it. You have to capture this place. That's why they tried so hard and failed. Why did the Germans attack Verdun? Well, they had a major problem on the Western Front. And that was the well-trained, well-equipped well-armed French army. If the Germans could defeat the French army, then the British expeditionary force would leg it back across the channel and sit quivering, waiting for a German invasion to come when it was their turn. So the Germans, to win in the West, they had to destroy the French army. They tried and they tried in 1914, 1915, and they didn't succeed. They inflicted heavy losses, but the French army rebounded, came back at them. So they worked out the plan that they would choose a significant place to attack. Certain in the knowledge that the French would expend every man they had and every cartridge they could load into a gun to try to stop them and capture the place back from the Germans. So when they looked around for a significant place, the first spot they chose was Belfort because they knew very well that the French had refused to sign the peace treaty in the war of 1870-71, saying, you put Belfort on the list of places you're going to keep, but you haven't captured Belfort. So that argument went on for months until finally they agreed the German army would march in, stay there for three months and march out again. So the Germans decided they would attack Belfort and force the whole French army into a trap to be destroyed by thousands of cannons and howitzers. Up until the moment when, at the end of the table around which the meeting was taking place, an old German general with a long white beard, he rose slowly to his feet and he slammed his fists on the table. And they all turned and looked at him. And he said, Belfort, I'm not going there a second time. <laughs> <laughs> so they reflected again and they chose Verdun. Why is Verdun so significant to the French? It's also significant to the Germans. Because if we go back to the era of Charlemagne, it was here in 843 AD that the Treaty of Verdun divided up the empire of the deceased Charlemagne between his three living grandsons. And the first grandson took the western part of the empire, which later became Francia or France. The second one took the eastern part, which was Germania, which later became Germany, Allemagne in French, and the third son, Lothar, the youngest grandson, he took the part in the middle. Lotharingia, the kingdom of Lothar, which nowadays there's not much left of that, uh, the other two big neighbors have been nibbling away at parts of it for years, but it's La Lorraine. Lorraine is Lotharingia, Lothar's kingdom. So this place, uh, it's the scene of, uh, what should we say, a family conflict between cousins, dividing up territory. The French on one side and the Germans on the other side. That goes on for, well, since 843 A.D. So With a thousand years later, they're still fighting a family They're still conflict. fighting a family feud. And the World Germanic War... tribes. And World War II was an identical repeat for the same reasons of World War II. Yes, it's crazy. Of World War I. It's just, it's just gone on and on and on. That's why the European Union came along and said, whoa, guys. Well, guys, let's, let's put a stop to this craziness. Now, um, Of course, the European Union is run by the Germans. So well, they're the ones with all the money. So, yeah, we always do everything they say. Yes, of course. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> So that's the reason they chose Verdun. They laid in a trap with uh, uh, a 1,000 or finally 1,500 cannons and uh, howitzers all the way to the north and the northeast in a big arc. And they brought in their troops and supplies, and then they attacked. And the French army, of course, fell into the trap. It rushed in to defend Verdun, this, this 
pivotal patriotic place where France was born. And their resistance was so fierce that they not only stopped the German advance, they threw them back. So at the end of the battle, 10 months later after it started, they were back at the starting positions and all those guys had died for nothing, which is a cane. And Verdun was the rallying cry for the French yes. army, World War I. Yes, it was. They were prepared to send every man they had in here. And most of the French army rotated through Verdun. The German units which came here stayed until they were decimated or destroyed. And here over the entrance is really interesting because you have here are the lighting tunnels that are only pointing towards the position on the other side that they're trying to signal. So no one else could see your signal here. And of course here's the observation for the cannons that are in here where you have the 275s and the rails they would run on. There are two outside the citadel in Badan, we might pass them. Uh, yeah, they, they pivot on that central uh, yeah. block and they, they run on the rails. Um, and the overhead monorail is to change the barrels when they're worn out. Yeah. It was 20 rounds a minute for several hours. And then to, uh, they have a nice little curve. Yeah, it's a nice big room. And you've got the the magazines now, you know, the shell, the shell magazines. The shells are small enough that you can hand load them and you can carry them handily. Yeah, there's, there's no elevator, no reason for an elevator up here. In the marginal uh, turrets, they had a, a Noria, a, um, a fabric belt which ran up to the semi auto breech blocks. This was bricked up, but what was this an impact? Was this a. What was this? There was no impact on the other. This was bricked up. But what was it? There's no, there's no dome or anything above us. And no, that's a firing position, isn't it? It, it looks like it. To shoot but. I'm strange. Oh, I never noticed that. More observant than me. A nice, large, roomy fighting area. But this looks exactly like the 75 millimeter precision at the Imaginal Line Force. There's yes. almost the same gun. Same gun, same difference. Yeah. This is a longer barrel, the only difference. Yeah. And uh, the Maginot ones have bigger uh, recuperators, so they don't recoil f f so far yeah. inside. And of course, you've got those beautiful um, hoods which take the ejected oh, shell yes. cases, still containing a little bit of burning powder. Yes. Because here you've got no ventilation when they're firing full. And you have full. black powder. You have, a, 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 you have a powder during World War One that would burn more toxic, at least initially. Yeah. And the war, the, the, the powder was a little more of a, of a mess yes. and a hazard. Yes. That certainly in World War Two, where you would need it less. But yeah, yeah. But it's in these enclosed spaces that the powder is more. When you go to a Swiss war, you see that the gunners wore gas masks. Really? With air, air can come to them in the 105 uh, gun investments. No idea I have enough lighting on this, with this for this, but alright. This is where people are screaming, hey, bring a flashlight! Ah, send the fucking car, fucker. Yeah, this is not enough light. Mm, no, it's just an empty space. Yeah, this is just the magazine hole. Yeah, they would need a big magazine. How many, how many rounds do they have in here? Do you know? Oh, they have several thousand rounds here. Because they knew, they knew the, German, the river was a, a basic weakness in the line. So they would have a lot of ammo here ready to, to fire. And they would be prepared to be cut off here for... Oh yeah. I mean, they, they were thinking surrounding, of being surrounded here, weren't they? Yes, it's what we should surround it. It's like the... Um, the paratroops at the Bastogne, remember? Yeah. When somebody said, but you're going to be cut off us around it. And they said, well, we're paratroops. That's what we're meant to do. <laughs> ah, absolutely awesome. But what's really awesome about this is it looks so reminiscent of World War II. <laughs> this is such a, <laughs> such a little step. Um,
And you still come across it in parts of the world today. Yeah. The damn thing just keeps on working. That's all you want it to do. Is this an evacuation for the shell casings? There's a tube, yeah, one of those five shell cases. Uh, I mean, look, you don't want those. So you had the two machine guns up here, World War I inside the turret, yeah. and you still had shell case evacuation shaft. Yes. So everything, everything you see in a World War II Maginot Line fort, well, it started right here. Yeah. And was improved in battle as well. It was. This is amazing. Except for the sad little little garage we're going to see tomorrow afternoon, where things went sadly wrong. And that was the only one. So you, so you had people turning this manually. Yeah. Oh, here's the crank for the. Uh, the turning. The crank for the turning and the gears and down there. So some there's and it wouldn't take more than barely a person to turn this. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely awesome. Absolutely awesome. This is absolutely awesome to see this. And it's, it is so much what people do not think World War I is. So the so weight. My this is my fault being unprepared. With the manual counterweight. Yeah. It's just... So this would raise up as well. It's in the up position. Before. It's in the up position. It will raise, of course, it because... Down. So when the weight goes up, the turn comes down. Steps. All manual. Yeah. Just run by a couple of dudes. Yep, no hydraulics, no electrics. Just, just keeps coming. It just keeps, yeah. I mean, this would be easy to restore because yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. it's all mechanical. Yeah. And the Twin 75 gun turret is the same thing. With its huge long arm and the weight at the end. With a with a, a ratchet you can turn it man when you can screw the way up and down. And what do we have down here? We have a rusting armor door. And then we have it's around the corner. Oh yes, around the corner. Because up here you have the observation dump. Which is yes. not exactly it is practically identical to what you see again, World War II National Line Forts. Well the officer or the observer stood on a wooden platform that could be adjusted for his height. Right? So his eyes were level with the slots. And if he was wounded, they could bring the platform down manually that he was sort of crouching on or lying on. Up the top there. It's, it's all manual. It's, it's it's just, yeah, because the, the crank, would, it would ride on this. And then, then you lock it into place so it doesn't fall down. You see the yeah. holes where you lock it into. Yes. And then you bring the, the platform back down. Yeah. He's wounded. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> it's really good. good. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. If you didn't know any better, you wouldn't know this was World War One. You would think it'd be World War Two. And the problem is, we're actually when I said this is World War One, mm -hmm. this was built in the late 19th century. No, no, this one was... Uh, this was uh, newer. Uh, well, I mean, you know, 1905 to 1914. Yeah, basically. That's close enough. <laughs>
coming out of the battlefield to the north of the city, um, they have recreated a little, uh, what should we say, not an adventure playground, but a, a relaxation area. <laughs> with a chapel, <laughs> with a... <laughs> oh, okay, for the, oh, so if the whole thing set up like the soldiers would have had it now. Yeah, 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 yes. And they would spend several weeks here resting, rest and recuperation before heading back up. But we're not that far from the battlefield. We're, no, what, no, no. a couple of kilometers away? Yeah, 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 yes. So the yes. rest area was this close? Yes, they'd have heard the artillery uh, barrages going on. This is exactly how it was set up. So you had a trench on the outside of the fort. Yes. As a, yeah, at the other side, there's a rampart. Can you see? On either side of that uh, concrete block, there is an earth rampart. So that's facing away from the city. You would have closer, closer, close defensive positions here. Yeah, and a little rampart at the side. And yet you had, sort of in the best style of the 14th century, uh, moats and fighting positions, ramparts outside the fort walls, so yeah, they could draw back into the fort. You actually, yeah, you actually have a. And we're right. So these are one of the little guard positions. Yeah. That is very, very, very narrow. I can actually not get through here. Yeah. Oh, this is uh, this is your suicide, suicide position, isn't it? I mean, no. <laughs> anybody go there? He's not going to. Uh, He's not going to collapse, he's going to chuck a grenade. Well, yeah, because you have... What do you have here? You have a... There's a hatch up here. Yeah. Oh, this is closed. What was up here? Was this... No, oh, this part, this is a ladder. There's remnants oh, of the ladder, ladder here in the wall. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, and then, okay, so this is interesting, because you have the machine gun position firing towards the back, and you have the grenade drop port right there. I guess this would be to drop a grenade. Oh, yes, it is. Yes. I will say, I hope the grenade rolls to one of the sides because you, you are standing right there. It's then, then it would be a metal tube in the, like in the Maginot uh, defenses. Yeah. So the, the, whole, the whole concept, well, I mean, the, the idea of firing ports and grenade drops, is that started hundreds of years before that with the old forts. Because we always rush in with 50 yeah. students. Yeah, that's a grenade. Launching, shoot. Yeah. yeah. You think you're clever. You're, you're at the gate and you're trying to hammer your way in. And just at your feet, somebody rolls a, a pair of grenades. Yeah, because there would have been a... What was it? Was there a, a gate, a door, a bridge? Yeah, a big gate here. You can see the, uh, the places for the hinges. The, the organization taught us. us Let's cut them off with oxycetylene. Yeah. Well, yeah. So it has now ceased to rain. Yes. Damn complicated weather. I think if we go this way, we can get up on the top. I see the 75 turret, which is not bashed about. So it's interesting how you, how you have a close defensive trench here. Oh, look, defense contre avion. There's another post. Oh, with an old wagon wheel uh, axle. <laughs> Well, they're hot to this one. Should be going down, no? Well, they have a lot of slip here. On the, the yeah, these wood. are these are uh, wood one, actually. Ah, the end. Okay. A lot more slippery than, yeah, yeah, yeah. than this. Just mud. So this, this trench falls all the way around, all the way around the fort. And they, they just dug this bit out and they're not. They're going to uh, put the red fence all the way along. Ah, oh, we're just going right up to the other end of the fort. We're not going to get up to the top. All oh, right. Perhaps we can cure. Can we? Yes, come on. I see an observation dome up there. So it's very small, it's very compact. I mean, the, I always had the impression that World War I forts were smaller and more compact, even with the artillery positions closer together. 
Yes, but this is because I mean it's for a garrison of about eighty or ninety men. Yeah, just enough to uh, man the ramparts and the gun turrets, the two gun turrets. It's, it's funny when you say ramparts. It's it's so very <laughs> yeah. Full, or, or, <laughs> There's ramparts or, around it, and you don't yeah. think of that. Now you see something interesting on the turret here, which you can't see on the other turrets. It's taken away, but it's still in position here. Ah, look, there's our trench going all the way around. Yeah, yeah. And there's the little command position, the lookout position. Ah, what do you see here that you haven't seen on the other one? Cable. The yeah. earthing cable. Uh, for lightning? Yes. The yes. Yeah. Really? Oh, yes, all their, uh, their metal works. More important in the gun turret, I think, than, uh, than in the lookout position, but still very useful. I've been struck by lightning once in my life. I would not like to repeat the experience. The Russians were very big on, on post-war, too, on lightning rods on every one of their facilities. Buildings, uh, magazines, everything. Yeah. Obviously magazines. Had... Yes. I yes. just don't remember any Western military bases I've ever been to where there was lightning rods. I never remember seeing... <laughs> them anywhere in anything. Well, there may have been cables like this, which were the easiest parts to cut away and take away and scrap. And here is your good old um, 1905 turret again. Yeah, there's... Now, this one hasn't got its earthing wire, but the machine gun turret has, I think. It's got a, wire, a cable like that to earth it. And there are the two guns. I think those are modern replicas, because the army took away the gun turret uh, armament. Oh, really? Very annoying. They've got a couple of fake Hotchkisses over there as well, which poke out. Yeah. We are facing away. Uh, We're facing southeast. Facing southeast. This, this controls the river. First continues behind those trees and heads on south to San Miguel. Beautiful view. Again, we're, we still have a fortress on top of a hill. Now, when they put these turrets into mass, you know, they put an extra wall around the um, private well, protection. That was the weak point between, well, well yeah, it was all right for 1914, but it wasn't all right for, I guess, in 88. But it's still amazing because this was a good idea in 1905. And in 1905, the majority of most armies had not realized what a... 1914 war would look like of devastation yeah. and artillery yeah. yes, so exactly. they were still I guess thinking somewhat ahead mm. I mean you, you did see yeah. the advent of, of the steel domes in the late 19th century to some yes, degree. Yes, Grusen built them and sold them to lots of people around the world or around Europe. So the concept the existed. Turret. Yeah, but it's, it's interesting to see how yeah, that's taken some hits hasn't it? I that's mean, it looks very, it looks very rough, and in the in the construction. Yeah, that's not how it was uh, actually put together. Unless somebody this tried. May it. have been a scrap one. I don't know. Maybe somebody tried to cut it. It certainly looks scarred. Yeah, I mean, that's a strange marking there, isn't it? Yeah. Going across. I wonder where that came from. And there's there's like a little little groove there. They may have picked up this uh, turret from another fort, you know, where it was used for target practice. Put it. So what, was this an, an infantry entrance? Yeah, this is the sortie point. Uh, you climb up the stairs inside to come and man the ramparts. So there, there was going to be ramparts uh, on the inside, there was trenches on, on the they're outside. On them. This is the rampart. So this That's was the firing step there, basically. It's been eroded yeah. away, okay? So this is an infantry fighting fort? Yeah. Complement of the fort was around 128 men to man the entire fort combat positions. But it was far from the German artillery and it was thus never shelled and survived intact. And the guys here have done an amazing job at restoring it to the original World War I look. And that makes it unique and worth a visit, because it gives us a great insight in how the soldiers lived and fought back then. But the designs of the fort built before World War I was quite interesting, as before the first shell even landed, they were constructed and built with one mindset anchored in a past war and a complete misunderstanding of how the next would go. The cupolas were plenty armed, some of them 30 centimeters of steel, but the fort itself was mainly one large hallway, unreinforced, walls between 2 to 3 meters, 
and ceilings in places of only 1 meter and 65. Now in previous episodes, we've seen how that went with other forts. But I do love these machine gun clutches and the observation domes, especially because I see them in several other countries and forts. No, so the French wouldn't wheel up a... Oh, they wouldn't trench wheel, gun. The yeah, little trench, four men would carry a trench yeah, gun Yeah, since poles. we have the little, little ramps would be a perfect place to wheel things up from. Yeah. No, they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, wheel... <laughs> you couldn't wheel a 75. The outhouse is authentic, isn't it? Yeah. This looks exactly like the front of any... Maginot Line, uh, pillbox, blockhouse. Yeah, Usually they end up as targets for hunters in the woods. They yeah. Blast away at them. It's very sad. Uh, this still looks a little bit off kilter. Oh, yes, it is. How did that happen? How did. Subsidence. Really? It's just sinking? It's so heavy, yeah, it's just sinking. That was a big heavy door. Look at the size of the hinges. I know. I figure if I. Stand skewed a little bit. It looks it looks like it's straight. <laughs> right. Yeah. This really those. Are, oh, but this yeah. is a small little turret for a guy to fit into. Yeah. Number five. Yeah. Because I mean, is that the size of the guy? Guy number five? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, but I mean, you couldn't stand in here. I put a little stool or something. Yeah. That's that. That's not five feet in there. No. no. They were small guys in the French Army. Those hinges, though, my God. That was a big, heavy door. Yeah, because you, you do really want to sit in here when people start dragging up something that's heavy enough to shoot through them. Ah, uh, there we go. That's... <laughs> I mean, if you get overrun, then you're gonna, are you going to lock yourself in there all alone? <laughs> I just... <laughs> and how long are you going to stay there? It's like, until someone will notice. <laughs> yep. There was quite a big garrison here. There were 25,000 military uh, in, in before 1914. And about 23,000 uh, civilians. Really? They had a balloon station and uh, an air base. Before the war? Yeah. Yeah? The uh, diamond ditch. The uh, diamond ditch. Forsay Of course, you have the windows here, which is which you wouldn't have. Yes, that's true. This is because this is the back of it, basically. You're, you're hoping the Germans are not going to get round this side. Yeah, but still, the basic idea: when the concrete falls, it falls in the ditch. It does not obscure your firing ports. Now I can't help but to notice that there's a little room yeah. with a staircase. Why? And where's the staircase going? Well, there would be an armor door there, I think. Well, yes. Here's the moat, and then as we come to the front door with firing slots. Well, there, fire, there would have been firing shots in the door yeah, as yeah, well, that one. Yeah. and as the door went, then you still have the insides, the chicane. And I love how the grenade shoot started already back then. Mm -hmm. I guess mothers are supposed to do that. Yeah. Well, and is this another firing position? So, well, that's not a grenade shooter. Oh, uh, come on now. Huh? This is going to be a little tight. So, mm -hmm. from the front door, with the firing position behind me, you come down to another one here. This is a nice little, oh, not an S shape, but a, yeah. a little ooh. Yeah. <laughs> and you have another one there, with the grenade shoot on top. This is a machine gun depot facing the entrance with your Hotchkisses, ready to grab them and defend your fort. Now inside you're going to have to bear with me because they have a little soundtrack running for ambiance in the background. 
So this is literally it. This is the way down to the top of the second part. And even the old Eddie Barabowski is glorious. A friend of mine named Luxembourg is the one that works. Can you imagine? <laughs> He was trying to stuff a, um, the, uh, the loading strip into it. He said, won't fit. I said, well, no, that's, that's the Saint-Étienne loading strip. He said, ah. Wrong machine. So these would be literally, oh, I love the way this was set up. So this is how the World War I, a little closer than World War II, they got a little more privacy for World War II, but basically it is exactly the same concept. Yeah, well this is shown, basically, you don't have to dig 60, 90 feet to do that. You're going to get health problems. How deep underground are we? We're not that deep, are we? We're only... Mostly proof. So that's up to one of the. That, that is the staircase we saw yes, upstairs. That's the block staircase, yeah. That comes out onto the run path. Oh, yeah, they dug it out a bit. It was filled with rubble last time I came through. Uh, the French uh, Army Museum and then the Well, we're one communication. Done the telephone, he told me. Which is a big deal. I always like to um, puzzle my students. As I say to them, right, uh, you've got uh, uh, Commandant, uh, what's his name, Renal in the fort. In the his last pigeon, he gets Vaillant out of the pigeon coop and he says, now Vaillant. There's what done, you go there. And by answer, goes with one wing and flies off. And the kids say, well, how do you do that? And some kids say, well, you train the pigeon. <laughs> you can't train cats. How can you train pigeons? And then suddenly, they're all thinking. You can see the steam coming out of their ears. And suddenly someone says, they were born in Verdun. I say, yes. And they fly home to Mama. But unless you stop and think about it, it's not the normal thing to say. You think of a pigeon, you say, right, off you go, pigeon. And it... It navigates and it, it gets It's a to homing it. pigeon. Yes, exactly. Brilliant. Which, which was, it's, it's strange because I don't think a lot of people are quite aware of how important pigeons were. Visit. Because they just said that the language is easy to write by pigeon. Really? Because all the radio uh, and signals were tied up by the, the disadvantage on so the ships. And so the journalists say the only way they could get a message through was by the pigeon. And they got the So this is the commander of South Yeah. The guy who holds the keys to the fort. So would, would they work in eight hour shifts like in World War II as well, where they would rotate? Oh, like a ship per crew. Yeah, they called the crew an equipage even in those days, like the ship's crew. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't know how long each tour of duty would be. Mind you, here you see, you're not keeping a lookout so much because this is in the back of the rear this area. rear area. So here the troops are really being let off for the, the most arduous duties to simply um, relax. relax and unwind. And, and I think as, as World War I went on, it became more and more apparent to the French that morale was really something to take serious. And I think a lot of, it seems to me that during World War One, when that war started, that was something a lot of the aristocratic officers in the, most armies had completely misunderstood, that they can't just not communicate and coordinate and neglect their, their soldiers. Well, you see, that would be your escape route if the, uh, the Germans come in the back. You have another escape route, another tunnel. Just like they would, yeah, that became standard in pretty much anything since then. But imagine, you know, the, the idea was to escape down the toilet. Well, if you're 30 meters under, it doesn't really matter. You're not escaping. You're not digging your way out of 30 meters. No. And this, so the clerk's post. Mm. Mm. The electrician's office. With those, uh, well, the cables were bare cables on the wall. That's what amazes me. 
And that cable drum with those wires looks exactly like it did 20 years later. Right. So everybody used everybody else's prisoners to do the dirty work. Yeah, you weren't supposed to under the Geneva uh, Convention, but uh, you say, well, if you want to eat, you want to drink, you want to relax, then, you know, you've got to join in and help the work, I suppose. Yeah, this is, this is very, this is very well set up. The, uh, the most important part of the French uh, Poirot's kit, after his weaponry, is, of course, his, uh, his wine bottle, or water bottle, <laughs> as you would say, which actually copies the, the old-fashioned sort of deer skin type that they had centuries ago, just a tradition. He's got to carry part of a tent with him. He's got to carry his eating equipment. There's his, uh, his, his cooking bowl. Um, I can't imagine why they sent these guys into the assault dressed like that. When the German stormtroopers of 1918, they left their kit behind and they just carried a bag of grenades or a, um, a, a machine pistol. Uh, and if they survived, they went back and collected their kit afterwards. But, but to run across open ground in shell fire and the machine gun uh, fire, carrying that lot is, is, is very bad. And it was hot and it was wet. Yeah. And got heavy and had wool. Well, I mean, they tell these guys, uh, you release on your handkerchief. Yes, yeah, that's how it's. Yeah. That goes to the lookout of the army. Yes. Now, I will say one thing I found in the World War I uh, trenches they are a slightly narrower, and the ones built in the late 19th century are a lot smaller. They're, they're narrower than you see them later on. In in uh, World War World War One and World War Two, uh, it's a sore point about trenches because you see the French and the British both invented the tank at the same time, without each side realizing. Then they came together and found out we both have a workable tank, and the French said, "Look, we have a war-winning weapon. Let's." hold back until we have a thousand of these monsters. Then we roll over the German lines, we crush them. They'll run like rabbits, they'll be terrified. They can't fight us. And the British said, okay, but perfidious Albion let the French down. They threw a handful of tanks into the ba into battle, at the end of the Battle of the Somme, for political reasons. And they fell into trench hole, uh, uh, trenches, they got stuck in um, shell holes, they broke down, they ran out of fuel, they were knocked out by shells, and the Germans captured them and worked out how to, how to counter them. And what they did was they dug their trenches much, much wider and deeper. They gave their soldiers anti-tank uh, armor-piercing bullets. They made the big mouths of 13 millimeter would go right through the front of a British tank, through the engine block and out the back, and through anybody who got in the way. And they brought up and hid nests of 77 millimeter field guns right up close behind the front lines, instead of holding them back and the gun lines. And they, when the French put in their first mass attack of tanks, they were slaughtered, blown to pieces, they failed miserably. So perfidious army let them down. The officer's toilet. Well, yeah, I will, I will say, I, toilet up the other end. I like that. Okay, that's the one thing. I would like that better than the national line squatting down crapper. Oh, the Turkish toilets. Yes, yes. yes. I, I do like those better. Yes. Maybe we have the observation cupola once again. Whoa, what's up there? Yeah. And it looks just like it would. And that would be hand cranked up, or did he just climb up and sit there? Uh, he would just climb up and sit there, I think. I pulled in a ratchet, and there is the gun turret. With the Noria to take, uh, those tubes would take the rounds up to the, to the gun turret, where the guns would shove into the, uh, the breaches. Yeah. So they would they would move the munitions up here manually by the stairs, yeah. and then they would be fed from that platform and up there to the guns, yes. which is above those two. Yeah, I see. I see munition locker. 
cars on uh, on both sides. Uh, well, you would say because for the Russian side, you abandon, you only put it into the tube, and you cut off the uh, the magazine. And you Spent munition casing yeah, would come down here. Here is a ventilator to take the gas out. And I think that's very interesting because that's one of the things that's classic of of World War II um, French forts. The Germans didn't really have any uh, any ventilation in their bombers, fire positions without saying. They also never had seen anything that to evacuate the spent casings. At least. The Germans were works at the sea for the damage after 1944. You've been to Katzenkopf, haven't you? I have not. <laughs> it's just over the Luxembourg frontier, I think. And it's a German C3 line uh, bunker. People like Ian Hogg, the, the author, laughed about the C3 line, saying German propaganda pictures in their newspapers um, made it out to be a deep underground multi-level uh, ouvrage like in you know. but really they were only little blockhouses where you wheeled an anti-tank gun or yeah. a machine gun into them and then you go to see the Katzikopf, the cat's head where you have a multi-level ouvrage type fortification with a turret mounting a flamethrower on the top and a power station, uh, you know, first aid, just like the East Wall. Yes, it's brilliant. And there were 70 forts like that down the, the German frontier. 70? 70. And this is exactly the same as you see in the Maginot Line. Yeah, the counterweight. The counterweight, down, the arm. Yeah, yeah, yes. And this was pre-World War One construction. 1905, yeah. 1905. So, yeah. here really is the evolution. And this is the, one of the spare guns, and yeah. it's much shorter than the uh, the field gun, 75, and it's got much bigger um, recuperator cylinders. So you've got limited space inside the truck. The 75 recoils about that much. Yeah. In the field gun, you can't have that inside the turret. You're buying against the end wall, so you've got a, a much better controlled smaller, shorter gun, but still a very, very effective weapon. Yes. You put an anti-tank round in that, it'll take out a Panzer III in 1940. It dares to come within range. Yeah. And of course, the candle lights that were <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> yes. I like they've even got the tool kit to work, you know, to repair the tunnel. So, World War One, they had electricity in here. Everything looks exactly the same as it did 20 years later. Yeah. Oh look, there's the space you send a very small guy To out. repair things yeah, that goes yeah, horribly wrong? Things get jammed in there, bits of rubble fall. Some poor guy's got to climb up inside that. Got a job I would like. Well, don't worry, neither one of us would be qualified for that job because we wouldn't fit. <laughs> Magazine, I'm guessing. Magazine, and just in case everything goes wrong, there's a thigh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For close defense and gardening. I have some shells up here. Some shells. I've got one of those. That is a that's a standard um, trap mill. And I also have an anti-aircraft shrapnel with a much wider head and a, and a much wider fuse. You know how they, they fuse those, do you? Yeah. With the, the two, yeah, it's great. And this is pretty much the same piece of weapon that was fired in World War I or World War II. II yes. Interesting little... So all munitions would have to be... What, what am I walking on? Is that a rail or is that a... It's a rail, yeah. it's probably a drain cover. It's a drain cover, yeah. yeah. Ah, 
was a heating boiler as well. So this is more galleries for the men and the window we saw from the outside. Yes. Yeah. Well, I suspect those are uh, replacement windows for security purposes. This is the office's quarters. For my uh, 1873 and my 1892. I fire regularly. Oh, I tend to go west of this place. Yeah. Uh, he's an artillery man with a red. <laughs> it's not the most. It wouldn't. This is not the heavy wool. It's, it's not the most expensive. Yeah, it was a bit friendly in here, wasn't it? The yes, they are very, very social sleeping arrangements. So here you have the water tanks, yes. just like we've seen today. So that was the, the downfall of Vaux. The concrete uh, tanks they had split under the bombardment and they ran out of water. Oh. That's why they had to surrender. That'll do it. This is interesting. Because you have the kitchen in here with more water tanks, unless. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a, a pump, a mechanical pump to bring water from a well. A German prisoner, people. Yes, he's wearing a German hat, isn't he? Yes. I mean, for a German prisoner to be working in the kitchen wouldn't be the worst of his place. Uh, no, no, no. Oh, no. Man. He's next to the wine store. Uh huh. That would uh, console him quite a bit, I'm yeah. sure. So they made a good job of uh, reconstructing it. It's all bare when they came in. What are we pumping? Water or? Yes, yeah, water. Water. Yeah, it's not, uh, no oil or anything. Yeah, yeah. there's no engine room. It's very ornate, isn't it? I mean, it's very. Ah, that may not be a military pump. That may be a pump they found uh, somewhere else. Yeah. Working on the same principle. And yes, it's a lot of work. <laughs> All these sounds, of, that, those are new. I haven't heard those before. Mm. So there's a lot of hope and um, five days and because they were in the front line, uh, dozens of troops uh, rushed into the fort for protection from German shell fire. They had about 50 or 60 wounded. They were lying outside in the corridors. <laughs> that would never be anywhere near enough to World War, World War One. Well, you see, if you've got a small garrison and you, you don't suffer casualties, basically, so you shut up inside the fort, you don't need the... True. So, is this, uh, this is air again? Ventilator. Ventilation, yeah. yeah. Lots of va manual ventilation. Yes, and again, if you're on a, on a charge, it's your job to turn the ventilator handle for several hours. Yeah. Um, uh, but that doesn't really So there's the other turret with the machine guns. Yes. The toilet is hungry. Oh, they've made the lamp room as well. I've just done this out. Oh, yes, that's very nice. Ah. Guy inside. Well, I guess we explained where the lighting comes from now. Lots and lots and lots of candles. I mean, I keep thinking some of the bigger forts were electrified, were they not? Mm, I think the Germans were the first to put a uh, generator into room, for example. Well, you see, um, even a generator, what does it do? It gives away smoke, doesn't it? It does. And they can swap you. And... But they did learn how to filter the smoke out. The French were good at that, the Belgians were good at that. Ah. There oh, are. Did you see the guy in Yes, I did. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
like the one we saw. Very efficient system. It, it really is very, very simple. Yeah. Oh, that, that's the munition chute. Yeah. yeah the, to see one of the German and the enlisted bathrooms that I see yes. resembles the horrors of um, mm. World War II. Mm. Yes, something to this general effect. Yes, I yes. don't know what you use. Uh, it is supposed to be quite good for your colon, and uh, it's, it's supposed to be very good for you because the, the way you, when you squat that way, by putting your legs out and squatting, it take, relieves the pressure of the end of the intestines. Okay, I got 42 centimeters with a little bit of a bow in the ceiling. But if you couldn't have gone into uh, the uh, front tank, you'd have seen how it bows in the middle. When the mixture hits it, yeah. the steel inside uh, stretches. Yes. Right, machine gun shoot. Where you can literally through here see nothing except the wall outside or somebody's legs. You could barely, you wouldn't even be able to see their face. <laughs> Not very painful. I mean, all you have to do is shoot them, you don't have to. And then there's the next one. Yes. And then there's the outside world. Yes. So there was a little building there. I think they had a munitions depot when I came here last. They said do not smoke near this. So. And how many of these were there? I mean, this seems like something they, there would be a lot of. This type of smaller fort. There were about a dozen of these infantry ones basically the inter intermediate uh, ouvrage. Uh, they relied a lot on the big forts, but then I think they realized they'd left big gaps between them, which is why they, they put an intermediate infantry work in. Or they put in um, a protected gun battery. Yeah. There are quite a lot of those as well between the forts. People here fought from every faith, every religion, all over the world on well, almost every side. Yes. Which is... Yes, it's crazy. So you see all these yeah. different architecture and memorials as well. It's very yeah, interesting. It's very... And in a thousand years time, when civilization has collapsed and been rebuilt again, some archaeologists come, come along here and say, I don't know, there were Egyptians fighting. <laughs> You've got the stripes down the sides. Stripes. And up above you have... The stars. The stars. <laughs> because it was paid for by an American citizen. Now, what happened was that at the end of the battle, all that was left was devastation. Shell holes in the mud, barbed wire sticking up here and there, the, the ruined forts and the bunkers, etc. And people started to come here to find out what had been going on during the war. And the old veterans, I suspect, took them round as guides. But instead of saying, well, that's a shell hole, and there's another shell hole, and there's a tiny piece of barbed wire sticking up out of the ground, they came here and they saw what looked like an, an old trench that had been filled in with earth. And emerging from the ground was a row of French bayonets. And so the legend grew up that the French soldiers in their trench had fixed bayonets waiting to repulse a German attack. Then German shells had landed nearby, filled the trench with earth, they were suffocated, they died, and they're still there standing up, still ready to receive the German attack with just the points of their bayonets emerging from the ground. This is a great story. Now, Mr. Rand came along and said, fantastic. He gave, uh, what is it, I don't know, 50,000 francs of his own money to build this monument in honor of these French soldiers standing up right in their trench. So did anybody actually excavate it to find out if it was true? When they were building the monument over the top of the trench, the French army came along to investigate, and they found out that, sadly, the men were lying horizontally where the Germans had buried them, and the bayonets were grave markers to show the French where their comrades were 
when they came back after the battle. There are a lot of French people who say, yes, it is true, it is true, but it isn't. We know it isn't true. But what it means for me is two things. That um, an American, first he was prepared to spend his own money to honor French soldiers, whether they're standing upright or whether they're lying horizontally, okay? Brave they Frenchmen. died in this place. They died in this place, in this trench. Uh, the second thing for me is that it, it reminds us of the great um, Franco-American friendship. I mean, when uh, Pershing came, uh, landed with his men in 1917, one of his colonels stood up and said, um, uh, Lafayette, nous voilà! We've come back to repay the debt we owe to you, Lafayette. War of independence. Yes. When he came along in his ship, they built the replica of it and sailed it to the States, loaded with uh, muskets. Yes. And the, the Americans were not just armed with rifles, they had French muskets. Careful of the step as well, look. Now, this is a very curious monument. It's a private monument, you can put a cross on it. Uh, one of my students, uh, I always use their reflections, he looked at this and he said, this is bunker architecture. <laughs> it's great slabs of reinforced concrete. Again, a future archaeologist is going to be bemused by this. When you go to the, the, the dome um, in, uh, in Normandy, yes. where they, uh, they launched the V2 rockets, or they were going to, and you climb up on top, and the air intake is a huge reinforced concrete tower with crosses in it. You'd think that was a religious <laughs> emblem for a, you know, a church or a chapel or an underground cathedral built by the Nazis. Our future archaeologists may... <laughs> <laughs> if we don't may keep history alive, there will not be that many generations before people look at these places, look at the bunkers, look at the forts, and have no idea what they are. No idea. We're still within living memory. Yes. And half of them, they, they, we still don't know what half of them does. Yeah. And that is absolutely terrifying to yes, me, it, that we had yeah. these important events. We have had wars where people have died in their millions. Mm -hmm. We had camps, we have locations, places, battles, mm -hmm. where people died in their thousands, mm -hmm. and we don't know why. And I think that's absolutely terrifying that yeah. there are there are mothers and sisters and, and grandchildren today who have no idea why their grandparents died in this place. Yeah. Because yeah. we're yeah. just the history's fading away and no one is looking. And we're back to maybe if everybody would make the archives a little bit more accessible, it would be a little mm. easier to research some of these things. Well, what we find is that a lot of the American soldiers who came over here, uh, they kept diaries. The French and British were, it was forbidden for them to write down what they were doing in case they fell into German hands. They knew where they'd been and, you know, their yeah. regiment, etc. Uh, but the Americans wrote down their diaries. Interestingly enough, they, they thought they were coming over here to fight the Dutch because they heard it was Deutsch. And the farm boys from Wyoming or wherever, they had no idea that there was a, a, a race called the Dutch. So and they, no they thought the Deutsch were the Dutch. So no change in the American education system <laughs> in 100 years, I see. But what they did was they wrote down their, their memoirs and their grandchildren are finding them in the lofts and putting them on the internet. At least they're doing that, not throwing them out like they are in other countries. But another yeah. interesting thing about World War I was the press was not allowed here. Oh. The media was not allowed on the battlefield. Oh, no, no. And what was allowed was propaganda and lies yes. fed to the press. They lie very much so. I mean, oh, yeah, th yeah. there are German princes that died several times in a week and yeah. became declared insane and what have you. Yes, yes. But it also the problem is, of course, with the massive slaughter that was going on, mm -hmm. with 20,000 French died in the second worst day of, of, of French mm -hmm. history. Yeah, yeah. You can't tell that you can't tell that to people because you're going to lose goodwill for the war. Yeah. But because the press was not here, the photographers were here. It uh, makes it harder to discern what actually happened. Yeah, there were twenty-three graves found, and all but five of them had their identity discs on, and they, including the officer, and they were moved to the cemetery in front of the ossuary. The remainder rested here with a cross saying uh, an unknown soldier. Unfortunately, the bayonets, the original bayonets, were stolen. The tourist office put uh, replacement bayonets in place and they got stolen. So eventually we ended up not putting any more bayonets. But if you look there, there is a, a concrete base with just the end, the gun end, the barrel end of a bayonet. The top has been broken off. That's the only remains of a bayonet that you see around here. No, they also sunk it into cement so yeah, they couldn't they steal it. it. Yeah, they could put That's it very sad. Yeah. But 
yeah, I can see this. This is a little. It does look a little World War II. Uh, yes, utilitarian. Oh. Yeah. Down there. So this was the trench that ran all this way. Was it a communication trench, or do no, we not know? No, it was a fighting trench. Fighting trench. Mm -hmm. And of course, they were killed in the French in the trench by the German shelling, and then the Germans buried them here. There was amongst the soldiers a sense of honor for those who surrendered. Mm. If they fought yeah. hard, they were. Yeah, yeah. In some of the forts in Belgium, the Germans would line up and salute them as they marched out. Um, That's what they did to the Fort de Vaux yeah. after they fought in the underground tunnels with flamethrowers and machine guns here, yeah. down from Douaumont. They formed an honor guard to... Uh, and one of the soldiers had brought his dog with him and he was afraid the Germans would just simply shoot the dog out of hand. So we asked uh, Commander Reynal, the, uh, the head of the fort, he said, can you pretend it's your dog? And then the Germans let him keep the dog. <laughs> That is the, the most important World War I story I've ever. As long as dogs are safe, I don't care. Yep. And I'll be honest with you, you have not seen anything yet. To come is some of the most amazing forts that was built, and some of them, the military have been hiding away for years and years without showing them to anybody until I showed up with my camera. We're gonna go all over Europe, and I'll show you some of the great constructions those built both for World War I and World War II and we can see the links between these forts and the history and hear some of the great stories and battles that took place in them. So get prepared, we will even visit the Napoleonic fort that the Germans fought with during World War II. Stay tuned, lots to come. Behind me is Van der Von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebmus nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing, trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you wanna watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, uh, my PayPal is there, protectionserviceint.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.